Hi, everyone. We'll get started. Um, so I want to welcome everyone to today's round session. Uh, just a reminder before we start that uh, we'll remain in lecture mode for the duration of the call. If you have any questions, please feel free to send them through the chat pod, which is located on the bottom right-hand uh, section of your screen. Today's session is uh, titled, Three Key Things All Public Health Inspectors Should Know Before Inspecting Small Drinking Water Systems. Today's presenter is Wendy Pons. Wendy is a supervisor of the Vector Borne Disease Team at the Region of Peel. She has taught a number of public health-related courses at Ryerson University and the University of Guelph over the last 10 years. Wendy became a certified public health inspector in 2005. She completed her Master's in Environmental Science and Management in 2008 and her PhD in Epidemiology in 2015. She has been con conducting research related to small drinking water systems for the past 10 years and has published various papers and books, book chapters on the subject. So without further ado, we'll turn it over to Wendy. Well, thank you for the introduction, and thank you for everyone that's attending today and spending their lunch hour with me. Um, you may be wondering why a supervisor of a vector-borne disease team is talking about small drinking water systems, um, but the reason is that um, I wanted to share with you the findings from my PhD research that I completed in 2015, and all of my research was focused on um, small drinking water systems primarily with a focus on Ontario. So um, I thought that there were some key takeaways from my research that would be useful to PHIs that inspect these systems. So I tried to pick out um, some key items that would be useful hopefully in your jobs or more specifically just your general knowledge of um, small drinking water systems. So there were four components to my research. Um, it included a systematic review of outbreaks in small drinking water systems, an analysis of small drinking water system data in Ontario, an operator survey, and also a number of focus groups with PHIs that inspect small drinking water systems. So I'm going to go over all four of those components today, um, but very briefly. So I'm not going to go too much into detail about the methods or all of the findings, I just really wanted to pick out the key points that I thought would be of interest to you. So um, the objectives for today, uh, we have three objectives. Hopefully, I would expect at the end of the session, you'll be able to describe characteristics that put small drinking water systems at greater risk for contamination, um, that you be able to identify characteristics and behaviors of the small drinking water operator that could influence the security of the water supply, and I would expect that you have a pretty good understanding of the role PHIs can play in improving the safety of the water supply for small systems. So I'm going to start off with a brief background um, about small drinking water systems, just so that we're all on the same page. Uh, basically, a standard definition for small drinking water systems in Ontario doesn't exist. Um, if you talk to anyone outside of pretty much a public health inspector, um, a small drinking water system means a small community system. Um, and in Ontario, we know that that doesn't fit our definition. Um, this work focuses on, or wh what I'm going to talk today about, is a focus on the Ontario definition of small drinking water system. So in Canada, like overall, they define systems based on the number of individuals that are served by those water systems. So they call a very small system something that serves less than 500 people, and um, a small system something that serves 501 to 5,000 individuals. In Ontario, our definition does not um, consider necessarily how many people are being served. The kind of uh, general description is a business or premise that makes drinking water available to the public and does not get their drinking water from a municipal drinking water system. And in Ontario, we have approximately 10,000 of these systems that fall under the oversight of the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care and to local health uh, departments across Ontario. So these systems can be very diverse. You can have um, a very simple system that's quite secure, maybe only has one connection. 
You could have a system that operates seasonally and utilizes surface water. You could have a more complex system that has many connections, um, could have an aging distribution system, or even have septic systems that are on site. And in public health, really, we see it all. So you could even get um, a well with access through a person's house or in the basement of the building, which I have heard from some inspectors in uh, more northern areas of Ontario. Um, so in Ontario, prior to 2000, these small drinking systems were largely unregulated. Um, and it was really the Walkerton water or break that highlighted key areas um, of water safety or concern um, for all water systems in Ontario as well as Canada. Um, but it also highlighted a need for the regulation and oversight of these small drinking water systems. When Justice O'Connor declared that basically all water systems should have the same level of protection and security whether they're serving thousands or hundreds of thousands of people or whether they're serving um, very few numbers of people. So why are we concerned with small systems? The majority of Canadians do get their water from regulated public municipal water systems, but approximately 20% of Canada's population utilizes, surface, uh, utilizes small drinking water systems. Um, and there are a number of challenges that these systems face that have been noted and documented in the literature. So things like having access to laboratory services, mainly due to the often remote locations that these systems are located in, having funds to improve infrastructure. Um, most of these systems are not funded by a municipal tax base, so having older systems that need upgrades um, are challenges. Um, systems that have adequate treatment methods. Studies have found that small drinking water systems um, often do not choose or have the available means to have an adequate treatment method put in place. And also having access to operator training. Uh, this is often a challenge due to the remoteness of the location of these systems again. Continuing, a study from the United States has found that small drinking water systems exceed water standards twice as often as larger water systems. And others have suggested that outbreaks actually occur more frequently in these systems, but often go unrecognized. So people that uh, generally access water from small drinking water systems are sometimes transient in nature. So they're on vacation, they're just traveling through an area which makes it hard to identify an outbreak that's occurred. And there's also a smaller scale of exposure. So an outbreak with three to five people is much more difficult to identify and track down as opposed to um, an outbreak with 100 people or more that have a common um, exposure. So part of my research that I mentioned at the beginning was a systematic review of outbreaks in small drinking water systems in Canada and the United States. And really the purpose of that work was to examine uh, causes of the outbreaks or trends that we could look at, um, and also to look at the terminology used in these reports. So as we know, the definitions for small drinking water systems vary overall. Um, and what we found was that there were 293 outbreak reports for small systems from the years of 1970 to 2014. So I'm just going to go over some of the findings from that. So when we examined outbreaks by month, we saw a seasonal trend occurring with 51% of outbreaks occurring in the summer months of June, July, and August. And this was statistically significantly different from the other months. Seasonal systems often face increased demands for water during peak periods. Um, and where they'll have many visitors for short periods of time. So this can put extra strain on the systems and possibly have an increased risk for failure. Uh, this slide is not coming up properly, but what this slide is showing is um, the types of premises that were associated with outbreaks. Um, in the first category there, 35% 
um, is the number of, um, sorry, um, were the premises camps and campgrounds. Um, so it's not really a surprise that we see that more outbreaks occur in the summer because many of these types of premises operate only in the summer. Um, the next category at 20% is kind of the other category, which was the catch-all like fire halls, um, garages, things like that. And the third category at 17% was restaurants. When we examined um, the causes of outbreaks by water source, we found that 57% of outbreaks were actually associated with groundwater systems. Um, which is much higher than surface water. This is likely because small drinking water systems are just more common to be found in groundwater systems um, as opposed to surface water. We also found um, in doing this review of the literature that there were quite a number of outbreak reports that lacked um, information. Things like the seasonality, um, the number of connections that the water system had, um, or even the type of water source, whether it be groundwater or surface water, was not available information. So when we looked at the causes of the outbreaks, um, the top two causes were inadequate treatment and lack of treatment. So uh, inadequate treatment was defined as having an existing water treatment system that failed to provide adequate protection from contamination. And when we combined um, groundwater and surface water, it was basically about 23% of outbreaks fell into this category. And it was followed by a lack of water treatment, which was that there was no water treatment on the system at 20%. So the difference between these two here is not great, but I actually think that it's a very interesting point. Um, it's not that the water system necessarily had no protection as the leading cause of outbreaks. Uh, in public health, we often automatically think a system with no treatment is at a greater risk for contamination. Um, but what we see here is that in many cases, the system, the treatment system fails, the protection system fails. So I'm actually going to ask you to put kind of a mental push pin here in this point because I want to come back to it in a couple slides um, just as to the leading causes of outbreaks. I'm now actually going to move on to talk about the second component of my research, which was um, looking at, we did some analysis of data that we received um, from small drinking water systems across Ontario that the Ministry of Health had provided to us. Um, it was data that was collected from 2009 to 2013, um, which was collected by PHIs uh, during their regular routine inspections and risk assessments. So we ended up having data for about 7,200 small drinking water systems from 35 health units across Ontario. And when we just looked at some uh, descriptive statistics, um, the there was only 7% of systems that fell into the high-risk category, where the majority of systems at 76% were considered low-risk. Also, when we looked at the systems by premise type, the most common um, premise type to have a small drinking water system was hotel, motel, or bed and breakfast at almost 18%, followed by restaurant, trailer parks, and place of worship. So when we continue to look at characteristics of small drinking water systems, um, we saw that almost 45% of small systems were seasonal, which I thought was a little bit of a high number, but makes sense in Ontario. Um, seasonal systems were more likely to utilize surface water at 81%. Um, compared to groundwater at 40%, and this was statistically significantly different. Um, and it's not a surprise. Many seasonal systems tend to be found on lakes in Ontario, and it makes sense. When we looked at the types of systems that were seasonal um, in terms of premise type, trailer parks and rental cabins were the highest at 89%, followed by parks and campgrounds. 
which again makes sense. 66% of water operators have actually not received, well, at the time that we did this analysis, 66% of water operators had not received any formal drinking water operator training. So this was um, highest, the training rates were highest in provincial parks. So 75% of operators working in provincial parks have had training where training rates were lowest in hotels, motels, bed and breakfast at 20% and restaurants at 22%. So when we looked at the data by water source type, we found that there were about 5,700 premises that use groundwater compared to only 933 that use surface water. So this falls right in line with what we saw with our um, summary of outbreaks reported in the literature. It's not that groundwater systems are more likely to have outbreaks. Um, it's just that more small, water, small drinking water systems tend to use groundwater as a source of water. Um, and when we looked at treatment, um, almost 35% of systems, uh, groundwater systems, did not utilize treatment where 48% had disinfection and filtration in place. So what we were um, really interested in with this data was, um, aside from just describing the water systems in Ontario, was to look at whether there were some predictors of water quality within um, the water system. So we looked at what types of systems were more likely to have a positive E. coli test result in the previous year. Um, and we looked at a whole range of um, characteristics. And the only factor that we found statistically significant was whether the system had water treatment or not. And this is a table from the logistic regression model that we developed um, showing those findings. So what this table is actually telling us is that um, water systems with treatment, for instance, groundwater with treatment, was uh, twice as likely to have a positive E. coli test result as a groundwater system with no treatment. So when you first hear this, it seems a bit counterintuitive. Why would water systems with treatment be more likely to have a positive E. coli test result than a water system that doesn't have treatment? So I wanted to use the di this diagram um, to kind of explain what I think these results are showing us. Uh, not all groundwater systems have treatment in place, um, and they don't necessarily all need treatment. If you look at the well on the far left of your screen, um, you see that it's a very deep well that goes through a confining layer of soil and um, is well protected from contamination. So these types of wells have likely had many years of good water quality, never having an adverse water test result, and never needing to put a water, uh, water treatment in place, um, which is basically that 35% um, of groundwater systems that do not have treatment in place currently. However, when we have groundwater systems that are not secure, like the well on your far right, um, they're quite shallow, the water table is in an unconfined aquifer, these water systems have likely had um, positive or adverse water quality test results in the past. So as a result, they've put water treatment in place, hoping that it would solve the problem. But without proper maintenance and monitoring, to ensure that it's the right type of treatment, contamination is continuing to occur. So I want you to, if you can, just remember a few slides back where I asked you to put a, a mental push pin in one of the slides. And what we saw in the outbreak data was that the leading cause of outbreak was failure of an existing water treatment system, not lack of treatment. And in Ontario, we're kind of, this analysis is, um, slightly mirroring those results. Um, in Ontario, water systems with treatment were more likely to have positive E. coli test results 
than groundwater systems with no treatment. So this leads me to the first point that I think is um, important for PHIs to know, that having treatment on a water system is not enough to protect the water supply. And that may seem quite simple, but um, it's important to note that public health inspectors should not assume that just because treatment is in place that the water system is any more secure than a system with no treatment. Uh, it's important to discuss treatment selection with the operator also because uh, research has shown that operators often make the wrong treatment decision when choosing it because they'll make it based on cost or ease of them understanding the treatment system. Um, UV devices are the most common treatment systems used in Ontario. About 67% of operators report using them in small systems. But these types of systems have limitations. If they're not maintained, monitored, or placed on the right types of water, or the right water source, they're not going to actually be able to do their job. So that's the first point I really wanted to highlight. Uh, now we're going to move on to the third piece of my research, which was um, a survey of small drinking water system operators. So we conducted a telephone survey with 332 um, small system operators in Ontario in 2011. And the objective of the survey was to develop a greater understanding of their experience, existing knowledge, confidence, and future training needs. So we found that um, when we asked them, how did you become an operator? The majority of people became an operator by chance. And what that means is that they happen to have a small business when the Ontario legislation changed and they were automatically designated a water operator. So they had a bed and breakfast or they had in the back that was servicing their um, premise and one day all of a sudden they're not only a small business operator but they are now a water operator. Um, we also had 24% report that it was part of another job that they did and 8% said that it was a volunteer position. So that's likely um, people volunteering at a place of worship type thing, um, and they may or may not have any experience with a water system. So about 40% of operators, uh, when we talked to them, had been in their role for less than five years, and actually 16% had less than one year experience working as a water operator. When we asked if they knew of any training opportunities that were available to them, only 47% said that they knew that training was available. Um, and when we asked them about the barriers to them taking training, the number one reason um, or the number one thing that they felt was a barrier was the location of training. So the training is not close to them. Um, many of these small drinking water systems are located in more rural areas across Ontario, and often training tends to be located in uh, more central GTA or bigger city um, type areas. I know um, through conversations with people that some health units have chosen to offer training actually through the health unit to try and overcome this barrier, which is great, um, similar to health units that offer um, food handler training. Uh, the, another barrier that was mentioned was cost. and. Uh, the final was time offered. And when they talked about time offered, it was both the time of day that it's offered. Um, so if they're working or their busy time is during the day, they would like training at night. But it was also season seasonally. So um, it would be nice to have training that's offered in the winter if their busy season is in the summer, for instance. Uh, when we asked them about their preferred method for training, um, they reported that they would like online or on-site training compared to classroom settings. We also asked them about uh, their confidence as an operator. Um, and we asked them to rate a whole host of things about how they felt um, in terms of confidence in dealing with things. 
So in general, they felt um, very confident to manage day-to-day -day operations, um, dealing with adverse test results, or dealing with agencies. And that was defined as like the laboratory or their public health inspector. However, people felt less confident in managing um, a little bit of the more difficult issues, things like having a broken treatment system occurring or having turbidity issues with their water or maybe having some surrounding land issues, things like flooding or problems with the septic tank that may be relatively close to the water supply. And when we looked at their confidence um, and how long that they had worked as an operator, they said that, uh, or we found that um, confidence was positively correlated with experience. So basically, the longer the person was in the role, the more confident they felt in dealing with a difficult and challenging operation. So this isn't much of a surprise. It, and translates to many different activities in life, from being a restaurant operator to probably a PHI, um, as well as a parent. Um, we need to, as, as human beings, we need to make mistakes, um, experience things, and learn um, in order to develop both our experience, confidence, and skills. So the second takeaway point from this talk is that low training rates and little experience in these operators really highlights the need for training. So we can't wait for them to be an operator for 20 years when they, feel conf when they start to feel confident in their abilities. Um, we can do some targeted training in order to um, target those greatest at risk with the littlest experience. And we can target them in a number of ways. Um, so we found that 66% of operators in Ontario do not have training, but that this is lowest in groups like bed and breakfast, motels, and restaurants, as opposed to um, provincial campgrounds where 75% of those operators are trained. Um, we can also target people based on how long they've been working as an operator, um, people that have worked in in the field for a short time feel less confident and would probably benefit um, more from training than those that have been dealing with water systems for a long time. So I think that this information is important um, in order to target training and promotion to operators that are out in the field. So we're going to move on to the final piece of my research, which was focus groups of public health inspectors who inspect small drinking water systems. And actually, maybe some of the people listening to the talk today um, had actually participated in the focus group. So I want to thank you for doing that, for whoever participated um, that may be on the line. Um, we actually had 20 public health inspectors participate from 16 different health units across Ontario. Um, and it provided a lot of great insight. Um, that I felt was gained from the group sessions. Um, we talked about things like the risks associated with different systems, um, areas for improvement, the relationship between the operator and the PHI. Um, and since this is the last point of the presentation, I wasn't going to go into everything um, that it covered, but I wanted to talk about two key points that I think would be most useful to you as a PHI. Um, those two topics were, one, um, basically how the PHIs developed their small drinking water system knowledge or what training they took that they felt was valuable, and two, what the health inspector thoughts were on key factors in protecting the water supply. So for the first point, um, public health inspectors reported ha having ministry training or formal training, so a lot of them had gone through that. Um, and they, they said it was good, uh, but they didn't rate it as high as some of the other, um, maybe more, uh, less formal training methods um, in things that they had picked up. Um, people also talked about learning quite a bit from the internet, or YouTube videos were a really big hit, because I guess 
when you come across a certain thing in the field that you've never seen before, um, YouTube has or is playing an important role in an inspector being able to come back to the office, look at some videos to actually see uh, what they should be expecting with some of those stranger things that they come across in the field. Uh, but really the main or the best training opportunities that people talked about was learning from their peers. Um, they said that either having someone in that same health unit or a neighboring health unit that they knew and a person that had basically become an expert on the topic that shared their knowledge with them was the best way for them to learn, um, to feel more confident um, and to develop their skills as a small drinking water system, as a PHI that inspects small drinking water system. Um, so although they said that this was the best way to learn, some PHIs felt that this was a challenge uh, because in some health units, um, maybe one or two PHIs um, have been designated as small drinking water system operators, um, or maybe they're the only PHI in their health unit doing that kind of work. Um, so PHIs, they did talk about feeling a lot of pressure to get it right. They didn't want to get it wrong. They didn't feel like they really had a community of people that they could go to and ask, um, ask questions or develop their knowledge from. So one of the findings was really that there's a need for more connections between PHIs, possibly through something like a community of practice. The second point, um, which I found really interesting, um, was when we asked PHIs what they felt was the key, um, key point in protecting the water supply or the key thing that made, um, made, would make or break a small drinking water system in terms of safety and security, they talked a lot about the operator um, and the PHI and operator relationship. So I found this interesting because um, when I was doing the review of past waterborne outbreaks and looking at all the causes of an outbreak, the water operator is never listed as a cause. It's either that there's no treatment on the system or there's a failure of treatment or there was flooding conditions, but they never talked about the operator and the role that the operator plays in maintaining and securing the water supply. So it was important to see kind of um, the more research or technical data analysis doesn't show the operator as playing an important role, but we as PHIs out in the field know what an important role they play and how the relationship between the PHI and the operator is so important. Um, the PHIs also discussed really what's important in the relationship between the PHI and the operator was that the PHI is seen as an expert and a resource um, for the water operator in terms of answering questions about the water system, water quality, um, any issues that may um, come up. So I wanted to share a few quotes that really highlighted that in this work from the inspectors. Um, words. So one participant said, they could still get results that are very good if they're sampling every three months and have a UV light. But what's happened in between, you may not know. And unless you have a good relationship with them, then they let you know. Another person said, I've had many times that people will contact me. They suspe suspect something, and it's allowed us to go out there and find the problem. So. I thought that these two quotes were really good because it highlights the fact that public health can really only react when the operator reaches out to us. Um, both sampling and conducting inspections is only, provides only a snapshot of time. And we're not there enough to really know what's going on day to day. It's the operator that has that responsibility. Um, Another person said, I think it should be a yearly inspection of these facilities. They may be taking their samples, but are they really looking at their treatment and equipment? You kind of find it out where these people say, yeah, a couple of years ago we had this problem. So um, participants did mention that when they returned after the four years, 
um, to conduct maybe their second routine inspection, they often felt they had to completely start from scratch. They were re-educating the operator, and in some cases, they felt the safety of the drinking water supply was compromised because of that, because there was no communication, there was no um, continual support for the operator. So that leads me to the final um, point three of the three things I think all inspectors should know, which is um, that if you can provide channels to stay in touch with your operator, it can strengthen the relationship you have with them and hopefully result in a better or safer water supply. So some of the ideas um, that came out as ways to stay in touch, because we do know there's big distance between um, travel distance in going to these places because they are located in rural communities. Um, and the inspector's time um, in terms of being able to go and do drop-ins is really limited. Um, uh, people suggested things like um, having text messages between you and the operator, emails, phone calls, even a check-in call one month before a seasonal system were to reopen before the, the start of the new year, to do things like remind them about sampling requirements, answer any questions. Um, and these, these were all suggestions that came up basically just to open the channels of communication so that the operator knows that you're there. And if there is a problem with the system, um, they can contact you easily in order to get your assistance as opposed to waiting until there's an adverse water sample or until you know, two years between the next inspection. So to recap, um, just the three things that I think are critical that I touched on today in this talk. Um, the first was that having treatment alone is not enough. So the data has shown us that um, just because you have treatment on a system doesn't mean that the water supply is secure. Um, in fact, uh, it means that we need to do a better job um, in making sure that those systems have the right type of treatment in place and that the treatment is being monitored and maintained properly because we're still seeing that even though a treatment is in place, a positive E. coli test result can come back from those water systems. The second is that there could be benefit in targeting training efforts to those operators with little experience, low training rates, or even by-premise type, uh, which could be worthwhile. So the fact that we have more than half of the operators that have never had any type of formal operator training is a concern. Um, there are certain groups that do have high training rates, um, and maybe we can target some of our efforts to those groups that have lower training rates, like um, the operator that's been in their role for less than five years, um, someone operating a bed and breakfast, motel, uh, or hotel, or a restaurant where their training rates are about only 20% of those operators have had training. And the last point is supporting the operators through multiple channels in order to improve communication and relationships which hopefully will result in improved water safety. So if you're able to make those connections with the operator so that they feel like you're a trusted source of information, that they can go to you um, when they see that their system is acting up, their water treatment is not performing like it should, they haven't had an adverse test result, uh, but they know something's not quite right, they can contact you um, for some assistance, and uh, you'd be able to assist them before they have an adverse test result or, heaven forbid, they have um, a waterborne outbreak on their hands. So I'd like to thank you um, for attending this webinar today. Um, and I just also want to give a quick thank you to my advisory committee from my PhD research, Andy Papadopoulos, Ian Young, Andrea Jones, Scott McEwen, and Katie Pintar. And also a thank you to the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care for sharing access to their small drinking water system data, which really allowed um, us to do some analysis and um, identify some really interesting points. So 
I will answer questions um, that are posted on the chat. Um, I'll read them and then put it, uh, say my answer. But if you have any questions um, afterwards, please feel free to email me or give me a call and I'd be happy to answer those questions as well. Uh, so the first question um, says, were total number of water samples controlled for in the study that looked at the number of E. coli count um, versus type of system? Variable. Um, we didn't have, um, unfortunately, the number of E. coli, the number of water samples that were taken per system. So that was definitely a limitation because we know some systems sample more frequently than others. Um, but um, it, the data was um, provide, that was provided was that we would have, um, that there was an E. coli test result in the last year. So unfortunately we didn't have that. Um, so that is a limitation of the study. So I don't see any other questions here. Maybe we'll just wait a few minutes. So I see that people are typing, so I'll just wait one to two more minutes to see if there's any um, more questions that are coming in. But again, feel free to um, email me or give me a call uh, uh, if you do have any questions or are looking for more detailed information. I know um, covering four, four distinct pieces of research in uh, 40 to 45 minutes is um, a bit of a challenge. So I did pick and choose what um, data I um, was sharing with you today. Okay, so a question from John. Um, could you share your thoughts on the level of uncertainty that exists because of the number of cases in which the agent is unknown or the source water is unknown? Of course, there's, uh, when we were looking at outbreak data, there was a huge amount of data that was um, unknown. So when you're looking at the um, waterborne outbreak reports, um, you would think it would be pretty commonplace to report whether it's a groundwater system or a surface water system. And uh, there's still a huge number of outbreaks that didn't um, report that information. Um, just looking here, about 30% um, of outbreaks didn't um, report that information. So um, there is uncertainty that exists with the results. However, um, what leads me to think that um, these findings are in line with, um, with what we can expect is that these results were fairly similar to other outbreak summary reports where they were summarizing both large and small water systems in their outbreak reports. And it also mirrors some of the information that we gathered just from Ontario drinking water data, the characteristics of these small water systems. So I don't have a uncertainty number for you, um, but um, that is a limitation of the study. However, I feel that um, we can be fairly confident with it because it uh, is supported by other literature as well as further components of this study. 
Um, so I'm just reading um, Eastern Ontario Health Unit comment, perhaps a challenge or limitation as a system with treatment may be flagged as a higher risk and thus due to their higher sampling ratio during a period when you may see a more likely chance of E. coli contamination. Um, it could be an indication as to why there was an E. coli hit. Some low-risk protected systems may sample January, April, September, December during periods when water contamination is at lower risk. That's absolutely possible. Systems that PHIs deem medium risk may have higher percent of chance to need to sample during that month, June, July, when an E. coli count is highest. Um, very interesting study. Thank you. And um, absolutely, that is a possibility. However, we did control with our study for um, risk level. So um, risk level was not a significant um, determinant of whether it would have a high, medium, or low, or a, a positive E. coli test result. So interesting. Um, Krista asked, um, if the research is available to us, um, absolutely. Um, three of the four um, pieces of research have been published already. Uh, one as recent as this past December in the Journal of Water and Health. Um, and someone else asked, can the slide deck be shared? I'd be happy to do that. So if anybody is interested, um, I can I'm not sure if we can share it through this sci-fi group. Um, or if you can email me, I'd be happy to share both the slide deck as well as the citations for the research um, or a summary report that I have. I have a, about a 10-page summary report of the four different um, research components that I'd be happy to share with anyone that's interested. So I want to thank everyone for attending today. Um, I'll just wait maybe one more minute to see if there's any more questions. It seems like maybe one person is typing still, um, or a few people, possibly. Yep, I can definitely send out my email, or if you want to just jot it down right now, it's just wendy.pons, P-O-N-S, at peelregion.ca. So we have a question from KFLA. Uh, when looking at the outbreak data, were they related more to mid-season sampling or instead the startup sampling for seasonal premises? Unfortunately, we didn't have that data. That would be um, great information to have. There were some limitations with the sampling data we received from the Ministry of Health. Um, so all we had um, given, which was not the number of samples that had been taken, but whether they had had a positive E. coli test result or a positive total coliform test result within the 12 months prior to the data being pulled from the system. So I have heard from a lot of inspectors that um, startup inspections for seasonal premises, they'll often have um, adverse test results. So that could definitely, uh, there could definitely be some differences there. Another question. Oh, um, is there any data available regarding whether or not operators are sampling according to the directives issued? That's a great question. Um, and I don't have that information either, I'm afraid. Um, from talking to inspectors across um, the province, my feel, and this is not based on any numbers, is that in some cases 
they are, um, and it may be related to um, greater follow-up um, from inspectors with uh, maybe kind of hounding their operators, where in other cases it, it, it's not happening as much as um, what's expected. A question from Wilberforce. Uh, I think frequent testing of water samples is done in Yukon and may capture the concern of more contamination in treated water systems. Thanks for sharing that. Very interesting. Yes, yeah, so um, someone posted my email address here. It's um, just a typo there. It's wendy.pons, so P-O-N-S. N as in Nancy, not M. But yes, that is, um, the rest of it is correct. Great, thanks for putting that up, Anna. So if anybody um, is interested, just maybe copy and paste that or jot it down and uh, feel free to contact me and I'd be happy to share anything um, I can help you with or answer any questions. So I think we'll end the presentation there and I wanna thank everyone for attending and sharing their lunch hour with me and I hope to hear from some of you. Take care. <laughs>